Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Michael B. Jordan. And ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Jamie Foxx. Well, first of all, first question is, not only how proud are you of this movie, but how important is this movie to you? Michael, let's start with you. How proud of my movie, how important is this movie to me? I think it's, uh, it's extremely important to me. Um, I want to say maybe four or five years ago, uh, agency sent me the book, uh, and I got a chance to read it. I was so intrigued that I watched TED Talks and his interviews, and I got a chance to get to know him as much as I could just from, you know, the internet or whatnot, and I was embarrassed that I didn't know him. I was embarrassed that I wasn't familiar with the story. So I kind of ran towards it, you know. Um, I thought if I could use my platform or my resources or whatever I could do to actually get this story out to as many people as possible, mm -hmm. other people will have that feeling of discovery as well. You know, I, I, felt, I felt motivated by his words and his work and how he spoke. Um, what he was speaking about and the way he felt, he laid it out in such a way where I felt like everybody felt a part of the issue. They felt like they wanted to do something about it. So um, it, the movie as a whole, just from a from an actor, the material, but to get a chance to portray somebody as important as Brian Stevenson, um, the the trust that he gave me um, that I was going to actually deliver on the story and not mess it up. Um, <laughs> the uh, the ability to to produce this movie as well, alongside you know um, you know Gil Netter and Asher, uh, and, and, and and distributed through Warner Brothers, an incredible studio to get this thing out to the masses. Um, I, I felt uh, it was it was all around a, a great privilege, I and mean, then I get a chance to work with my big brother. You know, I, I, like you know, you don't often get a chance to um, work with people that, you, that you're friends with. Sometimes it's like you know, we to be together one day, and uh, it, it never really happens in Hollywood. So the fact that the stars aligned the right way, and we were able to to work with our first project, or, like with something this important, it really meant a lot. Okay, how proud? How important? Uh, pr first of all, proud is this young man right here. Give it up for this young man. In front of and behind the camera. I knew, see, I've known Michael B since, you know, he this, was this, you know, before he had all this. <laughs> all this, right? See, look at, don't try to flex. Boy, don't flex on me. Boy, flex on me. Before he had all that, when he just had a little a tank top and some braids. Looked like he was from Hawaii. But what I appreciate about this, this is such an important film for all of us, and, and I appreciate what Michael B. Jordan has done, because if you look at his career, there's not a lot of, a lot of big time stars that are paying attention. And if you look at what he did in Fruitville Station, think about the DNA he laid down with that, where he had us all caught up. I tell him all the time, I had some thugs go with me to go see that movie, we was all crying, because you touched us in such a, an incredible way. And then to go from that to the biggest movie in the world, Black Panther where he plays Killmonger, but at the same time, even though he plays the villain, his narrative and, and, and what he was talking about was about our culture. And so now to come to Just Mercy, I think this is the most important film that I've been a part of, because when you talk about the perception of a black man automatically being uh, uh, guilty, this, this gives us an opportunity to artistically attack it. And I think that's what's needed is that the fact that you come be entertained and educated because these types of stories are so necessary and the character that he plays, Brian Stevenson, should be known all over the world. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when I saw the film in Toronto, I, I felt the same way. I was like, why didn't I know more about this? And you, you used the word narrative just now, Jamie. You know, there's something about the story of this film that even though it takes place late 80s, early 90s, the narrative of what's going on here hasn't changed enough. Can, can you talk about, about that? What is it about this that makes it so relevant and timely for 2000? You, you say it's... No, I mean, it's happened... This story takes place 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. And it's still, like you said, it still happens today. It's um, one of Brian's philosophies is close proximity to things. Sometimes the perception of what it is to be black and brown has already been dictated by the media and news outlets and what people see on the TVs and what they read in the newspaper. And it's already, it's, it's people's minds are already set. 
So Brian wanted to use that same medium in order to, to, to combat that, you know? How do we humanize things? How do we become close proximity to somebody that I've never really met before, I haven't really had a chance to spend that much time with? So let's humanize them through, through, through film, through our art. Um, but without using any manipulation tactics or tools to make people feel any type of way, we didn't want to tell the audience how to feel. We wanted to put an audience to the, uh, a mirror to the audience. You know, have them, you know, start conversations, you know, provoke thought. Uh, and, I, and I think through this film, you know, you're able to look at an issue that today can seem so paralyzing because it's so huge, it's so big. You know, people, they don't do anything. How can I feel a part of, uh, how can I make a difference? How can I make a change? This thing is so above me. Um, but that's not the way to look at it. That's not the perception. That's not the way Brian Stevenson looks at things. He looks at it from a very optimistic point of view. Um, he believes that he can make a difference. He, and he dedicated his life to it. Um, so, so I feel like that's what I ultimately want audiences to take away from this. They could feel a part of the process. They could feel a part of the change. I think that's something that's really, really important and shouldn't be missed out. You talk about the word manipulation, and I didn't feel any of that. I felt that all, everything that happens, all the emotional beats were genuine, they were honest, and the payoffs were earned because Destin Daniel Cretton, the director and co-writer of the screenplay, he lets the scenes play out. Uh, that how, how refreshing was that to be able to, to make a drama where the, the chemistry, especially between the two of you, just feels so great and it's dynamic? It, um, it, it was amazing, man. Honestly, like, I think it's an actor's dream to have moments where, you know, you have space. Like, actors have space to actually work, you know, and, and listen. Um, something that, you know, you would think is... Um, mandatory you know in scenes and movies but destined created an environment on and off camera where we we listen to one another you know um being able to work with somebody that i've known you know over a decade plus uh we had space we we we, we uh um it's like working with one of your friends or family you know um you guys can tell jokes you guys can say harsh things because there's no love lost you know that it, it's family at the end of the day when you're able to jump in the scene with somebody like jamie spox in our relationship there's a comfortability there that you can take big swings that you can risk you can take risk and 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 know that that you're being heard you know that the other person is going to give you what you need in order to uh to to, to get off the scenes and that's something that we really really enjoy you know, Destin, you created a great environment. In what ways, Jamie, did, did your collaboration with Destin help make the film better? Like, you know, what, what was the perspective that you helped him see that made Just Mercy hit home? Well, I think just to piggyback on what he was saying, you know, we, we just had a, we had a fellowship with those guys. Like, we come in, we play music, you know, no weapons formed against us. Shall prosper. You know, we come in, we, and, and that's part of you know, that's part of our heritage as black folk, you know, so we would come and we play that when we needed to get into certain characters and certain certain places that we had to go that were just troubling. But then we would play Marvin Gaye. We played some, you know, some upbeat, some hip hop, 90s, you know, puff. You know what I'm saying? We ain't uh, go with, no, I mean, just, you know, just to, you know, just, it, it, it was just a, we knew that the most important thing was what Michael and Destin were trying to do and get this story out and do it in a way where <clears throat> we didn't necessarily sort of go off the black cliff with the movie. I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but I mean where only black people could get this movie. I think they were brilliant in the choice of, of what not to put in. When you look at the, the white correctional officer, I thought this was very small but very important. The correctional officer, officer had contrition. He, he was filming it, so you see him toiling. So if you're watching this movie and you're white, you can say, oh, that is me. That's how I feel. Or if you look at the, the prosecuting attorney who was feeling, like, oh, this is wrong. So you're opening, opening it up to a human a human story, and I'm gonna tell you how we, you know it, 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 it turned out right. They screened this movie in front of an all black audience. It, it, it tested at a 97. I'm like, well, yeah, okay, come on. Black, yeah, come on, black people, cool. come through, black people, right? <laughs> then they called and said, well, they tested it in Kansas. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they tested it in Kansas, and Jamie would take this guy, I said, oh man, what they say? It tested at a 98. Yes. So 
take that and then go to Toronto Film Festival, which is heralded, and this young man gets a eight, nine minute standing ovation. So it's important for the people here, let people know about it, tell them about it. It's a really, really great film, really important message. The other message here. So a year and a half ago at the Academy Awards, so uh, Frances McDormand won Best Actress for Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. In her acceptance speech in front of the world, she said the words, inclusion rider. And like 98% of that world went, what? And went online and Googled, what does that mean? So what does that mean? And how did you make, help make this film, Just Mercy, the first Hollywood studio to have an inclusion rider? Um. I was in the audience when uh, when Francis gave that speech, and I was like, "Oh man, there's something that I could put on paper. That's like that's not something that I could actually implement." I mean, me being a person of color, you know, uh, you know, having a production company, that's something that I would have done anyway. Trying to you know create my work environment to reflect what that I actually live in. Um, so I made that a company mandate of mine at Outlier Society, and. Uh, I have an overall deal with, with Warner Brothers Studios. So when we're making this film, they uh, they ran towards that idea as well. You know, they uh, they um, they opened it with with, with welcome with, 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 they welcomed it with open arms and, and they made Just Mercy the first the first movie under that inclusion writer. And that inclusion writer <laughs> means that um, people from under upper represent, underrepresented groups. Uh, will be seriously considered for uh, head departments, um, de department heads on, on a movie production in front of the camera behind. So, you know, uh, people of color, um, women, people from the LGBTQ t t -Q community, um, disabled community. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're exactly going to get a job, but it just opens the door for them. It gives them a shot. You know, in Hollywood, we're very, uh, you know, it's human nature. We hire the people that we know, you know, the people that we previously worked with, and they can create a circle and keep people on the outside. But what Warner Brothers did so beautifully was open that up to everybody that is talented to give everybody an opportunity. So much that all of Warner Media, um, that we help them write that company mandate for them as well. So all the umbrella companies under that, under um, Warner Media, actually has that that inclusion writer also. So I commend them for taking the first step, and hopefully that that sets a precedence across the board to, you know, other studios and production companies. The you know arguably the best studio in the world is taking this step. I think other people will follow. So I think that was extremely important for everybody across the board, and um, you know I'm honored to kind of to to be involved with that. Michael B. Jordan, 2020. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah, no, boy. No, no. And you'll be the sexiest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just wanted to just back up a second. You, <laughs> Jamie, you've known Michael since you he was. Imagine being brilliant, boy. <laughs> Jamie, you've known, you've known Michael since he was. Yeah. yeah. How? Like, how do you guys know each other? I mean, man, look, first of all, I saw this. For, there's a reason why his name is Michael B. Jordan for a He can hoop. So I saw the boy. <laughs> they had this little bullshit uh, uh, NBA uh, entertainment. entertainment league where all the actors were trying to hoop. It was terrible. <laughs> and then he came in and, oh, my God, he, <laughs> he did some move on one actor. I won't say who it was. But he did a move and... He, it looked like he disappeared, and the actor ended up in the parking lot, and he laid it up, and then that they got mad at him because like, wait, wait a minute, he's playing. T it's not fair. We're supposed to, we're supposed to fix it like they fixed the movie. Anyway, he was. <laughs> so so we embraced him, uh, just as an athlete, you know, and then watching him, you know, grow from the wire, all these different things, and so, you know. I, I, I'm known to to have a lot of people come to my house or sleep on the couch or me give them information of, that I've been given from people like Quincy Jones or people that that are that are you know that are legends in the business. So I just pass it on to him because I saw I saw something special in Mike, and we were just talking we were just talking before we got here about what makes it special, like what makes a movie special, and I say that it's the person who you go to see. And when I saw Mike at an early age, I, uh, I just knew, and we all the homies, we just knew, he said, boy, that boy got something. So we just always tried to, anytime he needed something, just outside of the business, just, you know, to get your hair right, man. This, this, this place is crazy. So 
we would uh, embrace him as our, our little brother or our nephew or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and I think he's turning out just fine. I'd say so. <laughs> Yeah, he, yeah, he's uh, he's always been a big brother. When I first moved out here, echo everything that he said. It was just kind of, you know, LA could be a very lonely place when you're on this journey, this grind of like trying to make it. You know, um, you got to have blind faith almost that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And when I started, even before that, he was just trying to give me information. He wasn't precious with anything. He was very much so like, this is what. You know, this is what to look for, this is what to not look for, this is to avoid this, you know, turn left, don't go right, you know, or whatever it was. He was always the guy that, that kind of like took me under his wing. And um, and then when things started to pick up, I think sometimes that's when things get the most hectic. Um, you know, when distractions and, you know, things start coming at you and they seem like they're moving a million miles an hour. He was just always kind of making sure I keep my spirit and my, and my mind right, what was going on. And, and yeah, he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was the guy. So when you reached out, and you finally have this chance to work with him. And yeah. the first, let's say the first scene that you see in the film, yeah. uh, the chemistry between the two of you, you feel it immediately. It is so organic and natural and infectious. Uh, what, what was it like to be able to finally act, work together, especially in a film like this? Yeah, and shout out to Toby Emmerich who, uh, at Warner Brothers who, uh, who backed me up big time on that. Yeah, come yeah. on out, Toby. Yeah, yeah. He, he had a uh, he he, uh, he backed me up. Toby, come on, on out. That one. Um, and yeah, he, he knows what's up, man. It, it was a it was it was a big deal, honestly. Uh, and, and Jamie came through the way the way we knew he would. Um, but but it was it was it was awesome, man. To see him, you know, fully immersed into that character. Um, the first time we worked together was the first time Brian and Walter actually met, you know, and that doesn't always happen all the time. One movie says we shoot out of order, you know, obviously, but the fact that we were able to block all those scenes, you know, in chronological order was a blessing because we were able to actually play that freshness and that news, that newness as we, as we shot the movie. Um, people don't know this, but I had a, I had a pinched nerve in my back and my shoulder during like during the first, the first, four weeks, three weeks of shooting. So the first day it was excruciating. Like I was laying on the floor. It was, it was, it was like, it was tough. It was like really, really tough. And Jamie would play music for me. He would play music to kind of get me in the mode. And then, you know, rolling action, I would pop, prop myself up and get the go. But it added something to that scene, that, that kind of, um, that camaraderie. Um, in the beginning, Brian kind of comes into this very, you know, hopeful and naive and think, you know, and he thought he knew everything about, you know, what he was kind of getting himself into. And, and Walter very firmly shuts that down. You know, you, you're not as prepared as you, as you think you are. You don't know anything about this and really made Brian go back to the drawing board and figure out if this is something that he was really built for. Um, so, so, and as we progressed and shot the scenes where we started to build that bond and get that relationship, uh, you know, it, it, it it, it, it progressed, you know, and, and like I said, I'm working with somebody that I know, so we can take choices. So like when he slams, you know, his hands down on, you know, on the desk and that really like, you know, startled me. That was like the first time he did it. And I was like, oh shit, like, oh shit. Like, like <laughs> I try to keep it together, but then we clock it. So we know that works. So like, okay, cool. It's, you know, if you don't know, obviously, you know, it's whatever it, you do multiple, multiple, multiple takes. So you can do it once, but you gotta, you gotta be consistent with it. But what we, what we really found a way to do and you know with the help of Destin is trying to get variations you know we got okay that's a take that works that's a version that works it's another version that works it's another version that works so we can give the editors options you know in in the post because you shoot you write one movie you shoot one movie you edit one movie you know and hopefully at the end you got something that lends itself to the story that it's supposed to be so we just wanted to give them as many options as they could to, to craft the story the way they needed to be and um and that just lends itself to have somebody that, that you're really comfortable with and be able to to play with those notes. You know, you're you're playing a character that you had not been able to meet. How, what were the challenges in that? Well, in actuality, is I've I've met Walter McMillan several times because as a as a black man in America, um, that perception of that you're already guilty, um, we could tap into that. Uh, I don't like jail. I didn't like. None of the, the jail cell. I was like, let's hurry up, shoot this, and get on out of here. Because I don't like, 
I don't like the concept. I don't like the perception of it. It's, it's, it's sometimes we're so riddled with the perception that we, I talk about this all the time. Is that we even start rapping about it? Like being in jail is like cool, you know. And it, it just ain't. And, and the reason I could, the reason I could feel Walter McMillan because my father, um, they put my father in jail for twenty five dollars worth of illegal substance. They put him in jail for seven years. So they didn't understand though that my father taught black studies. Uh, in the hood, that's in, in uh, South Dallas for 25 years. The very judge that he used to have come talk to the kids presided in his case, put him in the jail cell next to the kids he taught. But they didn't understand that that father taught me how to play tennis, taught me how to swim, taught me things that they do on the other side of the track. He said, "I want you to be well rounded." That's that's taken from me, and I can't. I don't go visit nobody in jail because I don't ever want to see that. You know. So I wrote him one letter. I said, hey, you know, you get out, you know, I, I'll, I'll save your life. And by that time, while he was in there, that's when I was getting on. I was coming on. I was making my mark. I said, when you get out, we got something good. And when we got out, you know what I got a chance to do? I got a chance to take him to the U.S. Open because he loved tennis. So he watched Venus play. So it's every story don't work out like that. But I could take that story and place it right on top of this story. Saying, here's Walter McMillan stuck. And the worst thing you can give a person on death row is hope. And then hope walks in. In the form of Brian Stevenson, played wonderfully by Michael B. Jordan. And now we hope that this, this is the new narrative that we talk about on our social platform. When I ask uh, one of the scenes, the first, the the, uh, the the last scene, the uh, when Walter is is freed, uh, just how was it filming that scene? I mean, it's such a incredibly powerful moment, and the everything the previous two hours just builds to that emotional crescendo. How far into filming did you film that scene, and what was it like to film that scene? I want to say we shot that closer to the to the to the second half of the of the of the, of the shoot, and like actors, like they have, you know, when you read the script, there's certain scenes in the movie that you just circle. You're like, okay, that one I'm looking forward to. That one, that one is really really important. You put it up, and you're like, all right, this is the one that I need to like, you know, put a lot of effort into, give a little extra attention to, and that was one of them for me. It was. Um, it was really important to the movie. It was really pivotal for for for, for um, Walter's case, and and I really wanted I really wanted that that scene to, to do well. It was, it was the most dialogue I think I ever had in like one scene all at once, and uh, and um and and it's not like other scenes or movies where you can kind of ad lib and 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 and, and, and uh, impro like imp improvise through certain things or just saying how you feel this is this happened this transcripts you know what i'm saying this is this is word for word you gotta you gotta kind of nail it um that's brian's legacy so it was a lot of pressure uh to kind of nail that stuff so you know it was a it was a scene that i really wanted to nail and unfortunately you know with, with, with jamie's like support through that I uh, I was able to nail it, and, and I think it turned out it turned out it turned out pretty good. It, it was fantastic, and I, and I'll say that that speech, and I hope that that when the DVD comes out, you'll see all of what went on with it because that speech was so important to everything. And I watch; it's great to see actors act. It's great to it's one thing to be on a set with a celebrity and a movie star, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when a person is really an actor, he says, "I really want this to be right." And at a certain point, Michael made a couple of flubs, and he's so nice. He was like, "I'm oh, sorry, so I apologize. I said, sorry, bro, bro. I'm sorry." And so I just pulled him to the side. I said, "Hey, man, this is you. This is yours. You built this. If it take you 30 minutes to say one line, you take that time." And he went off to the side. And he came back, and he lullabied that thing. And when he lullabied it, the people behind us, the extras, gave him a standing ovation. But what's crazy, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But he never saw it, because he was 
and actors know what I mean by this. He was he was in the moment, and I even went to 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 touch his arm and say, "Great job!" And he, you know, and you know, walked out. I was like, "Uh oh," and you know, you know, black people call that the Holy Ghost. Oh, you got the you got the Holy Ghost. The actor Holy Ghost. But I texted him and I said, "You just finished something amazing," and the people behind you are weeping and giving you a standing ovation. And then we get to where you were, Toronto Film Festival, and he gets a nine minute standing ovation and he got to see it. Last question. Last question. You know, if there's one review that matters, it's Brian's. What did he think? What was it like for him to see the movie for the first time? Yeah, man, he gave me a big hug. <laughs> he gave me a big hug. And it was, um, I got, when I did Fruitville Station, I got a chance to watch uh, Oscar's family, his mom and his uncles and his cousins and all his friends watch the movie. And, and I was like like a row behind them. And I was just kept peeking throughout the movie, just trying to see anything, reaction. I was like really nervous. And I was kind of doing the same thing this time around with Brian. Just to, you know, I knew how hesitant he was about doing a movie. Um, he didn't really trust Hollywood. You know, he heard so many horror stories about, you know, um, adaptations and things like losing the integrity of, of, of the actual material. Um, and the fact that he trusted us to make this movie to tell his story, I just wanted to make sure I, you know, made him proud, you know. Um, so, you know, when we had a standing ovation, he, you know, he gave me a big hug and was like, man, I'm so happy. I'm so proud of you, man. So, like, that was, uh, for me, that was... You know, that's what really mattered. Well, you made everybody proud. Everyone in this movie made everybody proud. So, so just uh, one request to uh, everybody to stay seated while we exit. Another request. So the movie opens. You've all seen it three days before it opens. It actually opens in New York and L.A. on Wednesday, Christmas Day. And then it opens nationwide on January 10th. So here's what you do. How do you spread the word about a movie these days? You go on social media, right? So go on Facebook, go on Instagram, go on Twitter. You in the back, if you're still using MySpace, that's totally cool. Spread the word about Just Mercy, and please do watch uh, for your consideration on Collider Video. Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Foxx. Thank you guys Thank for coming. Thank you so much.